shared commonality across all of these people that are developing type 2 diabetes anyway, regardless of what their BMI is, is the accumulation of too much fat inside or organs, between organs, fat where it shouldn't be. And for for various reasons, that's occurring in some people who are what we would describe as a normal BMI. It's not the majority of people. And then for everyone else, it's occurring at you know, higher BMIs, but common amongst all of them. And what seems to be driving the metabolic consequences is this fat that is finding its way into the wrong tissues. And Roy Taylor's most recent study kind of highlights that there's also a shared intervention that if you can adopt a hypocaloric diet, hypocaloric meaning less calories than your body sort of requires to maintain its weight, and you can do that in a way where you are able to reduce your total body weight by enough such that you get the fat out of the wrong places, then you can begin to kind of unwind some of this this metabolic these metabolic derangements that are occurring. And in many people, if you if they haven't had that condition for too long, go into uh, what's described as as remission. Do you think that that is is similar for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in that I mean, the majority of people that develop this, are probably overweight or obese, but there there could be a kind of lean phenotype or a, a, a person who have normal BMI that gets non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and without having the study, I, I'm not. I don't believe there's been a study looking specifically at this with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But do you think it's it's the same scenario where, um, regardless of that person's BMI, if they adopt a hypocaloric diet? and lose enough body weight, they can get the fat out of the liver and reverse the, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, to the point where all of those biomarkers and, and um, diagnostics sort of return to, to normal levels. Yes. I, I mean, uh, I think what you're describing is, is an overarching um, commonality uh, that, that may encapsulate the the drivers of of metabolic disease overall and so it's almost at a level of principle that that description is accurate and obviously then the kind of specifics may differ uh you know relative to what exactly we're talking about um between say for example fatty liver versus type 2 but as an overarching unifying principle that we have the excess accumulation uh, of fat in the liver, driving hepatic insulin resistance, um, contributing to an increased concentration of circulating free fatty acids, particularly in the in the postprandial period or in the period after a meal, therefore influencing new triglyceride synthesis. Um, impairing the clearance of of triglycerides in the postprandial period or post meal period, and so you, you know you mentioned that that Guy and I used the term you know energy toxicity. Well, we have this term lipotoxicity, which is really characterizing all of that as 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 an umbrella term for all of those factors that I was just describing. This increase in flow of fats to other tissues, which then drives you know the uh, increased inflammatory profile of adipose tissue. If we're talking about these visceral uh, depots, liver depots, immune responses, oxidative stress, and so th this is the th this is potentially present in individuals at different levels of BMI, and would imply that the intervention. And we know from the, the body of available intervention evidence on hypocaloric diets, like, like we alluded to earlier, that macronutrient composition is secondary to the restriction of, of energy intake will allow for, for that clearance. And we do know that there is, uh, you know, individuals can be characterized by fatty liver in the absence of uh, a BMI in the obese categories range. 
So to your point, does does the similar proposition offered by by the retune study uh, apply in the context of fatty liver? Overall, we would we would say, I think, from the body of evidence that it does. This episode is proudly brought to you by Inside Tracker. Track your blood biomarkers, understand your biological age, and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health. To get started with Inside Tracker today and get 20% off your first purchase, head to insidetracker.com forward slash Simon. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. So how much overlap is there between non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and type 2 diabetes? And is it possible that someone is diagnosed with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but they they don't have type 2 diabetes because their their pancreas is you know able to sort of compensate and just produce more insulin and they're able to kind of keep their blood glucose within the normal range despite the excess fat that has been accumulating in the liver and the insulin resistance there yes so it is possible that an individual have fatty liver without necessarily a diagnosis of type 2 so they Conditions can exist independently, but in terms of, I guess, the modern, because of course, you know, type two diabetes can itself be be influenced strongly by by genetic risk factors, can occur at kind of normal weight BMIs, etc. Both can exist independently, but in the context of, you know, what we're dealing with in a in in, in the population now with the 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 abundance of of excess energy etc the correlation between the two is particularly strong and they and they may coexist and the co the coexistence of fatty liver and type 2 diabetes is associated with you know an overall worse risk profile a metabolic profile than simply having uh, either uh, alone in terms of overall prevalence uh of of the correlation of the coexistence of the two conditions uh there was a meta analysis in 2017 that suggested on average the pooled prevalence was was just about 60% uh in terms of the association between fatty liver and type 2 diabetes incidence but the actual individual study estimates ranged uh, and, and, and we're in some studies, I think the highest uh, prevalence of, of, of the coexistence was was 87 percent um, in one study. So but but the, again, the average prevalence in the in the analysis was was about 60 percent. Um, and it, it, if we're talking about the overall, uh, you know, we've been discussing a lot the kind of under the hood kind of mechanistic stuff here it's it's unsurprising um we know obviously we we we've touched on this but to to kind of circle back to i guess re-emphasize and cement it in listeners heads you know if the liver becomes fatty the liver becomes insulin resistance that that resistance to insulin um then impairs the suppression of liver glucose production that would occur in an otherwise healthy individual that's just consumed a meal so you get increased fasting fasting glucose levels you get elevated insulin levels um you've got obviously the exacerbation of of overall insulin resistance and even skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity from continually elevated circulating fatty acids and indeed the accumulation of intramyocellular so the accumulation of fat and muscle cells um all influencing you know the the overall kind of stage of insulin resistance and then of course there is this lipotoxicity we mentioned briefly just there where this excess accumulation of fat in the liver and in visceral organs starts to to spill over um, and this can include the pancreas and the pancreas itself can start to increase its fat depots uh, and the consequence of this increase 
of 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 fat in the in the you know in the in the cells of the pancreas is to you know impair the you know signaling pathways ex- associated with the the uh, uh, with with insulin function um you know the defective um ability for insulin to and, and the beta cells to produce and um release insulin and so you get this progressive decline in the in the capacity of the beta cells to function and that's the primary hallmark characteristic that predates a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes so you've got elevated glucose factors or hyperglycemic factors you've got elevated insulin um factors and and elevated insulin resistance in the liver all complicated by by fatty liver you've got this relationship with circulating lipids non-esterified or free fatty acids and elevated triglycerides all kind of interacting where the presence of, of fatty liver can drive the progression of of type 2 diabetes um and you know there there are there are kind of little little available pharmaceutical interventions that are specific to fatty liver um some diabetic drugs can have kind of it seems effects but 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 really the capacity to exert um a kind of reversal of the levels of fat in the liver to to normal ranges is is very much you know something that 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 can be influenced by a diet of course energy balance within that and um you know specific nutrients then secondary to energy balance and uh physical activity as well <laughs>